Okay. So, um, just to brief, in spite of a uh, lot of interest and a lot of uh, efforts, you know, to uh, conduct total intravenous anesthesia as uh, a routine practice, uh, conventional anesthesia with wallet anesthetic still remains the mainstream. Maybe because our training is focused on conventional anesthesia with gases, that is how we develop our competency and the availability to use the gases is, uh, you know, better. Uh, the exposure and expertise in total intravenous, uh, intravenous anesthesia is limited and uh, probably the availability of the drugs and equipments is also not uh, up to the mark uh, all across and that's the reason uh, still total intravenous anesthesia is not being practiced very routinely though there is a lot of interest. So we'll see where we stand now and uh, what is the future ahead. So total intravenous anesthesia also described as TIVA is defined as a technique of general anesthesia using a combination of intravenous anesthetic agents given exclusively by intravenous route without the use of any volatile agents, uh, excluding oxygen, air, uh, which is not an anesthetic agent. The requirement of total intravenous anesthesia are the three points. One is an ap appropriate drug and a device to inject and administer that drug uh, as per the necessity and preferably a monitor to understand the state and stage of anesthesia. So these are the three basic requirements that we have. So why total intravenous anesthesia? What are the advantages? So when we think of TIVA, we have a smooth and predictable induction, a reliable and titratable maintenance with a rapid recovery. As the recovery is rapid and clear, the discharges can be early. It also reduces the post-operative uh, incidence of agitation and post-operative incidence of nausea vomiting. There's a low neurohumoral response, which probably leads to a better hemodynamic stability. It preserves hypoxic uh, pulmonary vasoconstriction and thus improves the ventilation perfusion uh, uh, mismatch. And it also provides better intracranial dynamics and also preserves the cerebral lateral regulation. Going beyond the patient, it is also uh, contributes less to the environmental pollution, which has been probably a uh, topic of discussion nowadays when it comes to the volatile agents. So what are the indications of total intravenous anesthesia? Total intravenous anesthesia basically started for office-based surgeries and uh, in neurosurgeries. But we have gone beyond that and there are a lot of indications. Can be divided into patient indications where patients susceptible for malignant hypothermia, patients with neuromuscular disorders, patients who has history of severe post-operative nausea vomiting, difficult or uh, reactive airway risk um, can be the indications. Uh, surgical indications are for tubeless airway surgeries, neurosurgery, especially when we are performing neurophysiological monitoring, surgery with high risk uh, PONV and short paced procedures or the office based procedures. It can be also a better choice uh, when patient needs to be transferred from one unit to the other. Um, remote anesthesia outside the operation theater can also be used in critical care for sedation. Uh, whenever there are environmental concerns, it can be an indication for total intervention anesthesia. And, uh, may reduce other cancer recurrence, that is what the data says. So when it comes to the total intravenous anesthesia, uh, it, it has got a wide range, can be used just as a sedation or can be used just as a conscious analgesia to a complete general anesthesia. And depending on the procedure and the requirement of the patient, patient can continue to breathe spontaneously without any airway device, or we may use some airway um, uh, accessories like nasal or oral airway or laryngeal mask or patient can be intubated. So it's a wide basket of uh, sedation to anesthesia and airway can also be manipulated depending on the requirement. So we'll come to the drugs used for total intravenous anesthesia. There's something Voice is lost, Dr. Vikas, no? Your voice is not heard. Plastic should be devoid of adverse effects and be cost effective. So different drugs which are available and being used, primarily propofol remains the prime drug. Uh, can be supplemented with opioids, ketamine, dexmedetomidine, and there are certain other adjuvants which can be used as a part of total intravenous anesthesia. So whichever drug we are using, first we need to understand the concept. We are not going to get into the detail of this, but we just need to roughly understand what is three compartment model. Uh, 
So when we inject any drug into the intravascular uh, space, it first goes into the central compartment, which is formed by the plasma. And then it will get redistributed into the two other compartment. One is muscle and other is lipid. Once there is equilibration here, the drug will, uh, the drug will start going to the effect site, that is the brain. And as drugs start getting metabolized, will get eliminated through the kidneys. Now there has to be an equilibrium at all these uh, three compartments and the effect site and the kidneys so that a constant state of plasma concentration is achieved and maintained to have a constant depth of anesthesia. So once we understand three compartment model, let us see how we can administer. So either we can use a single drug as total intravenous anesthetic or we can use combination of drugs. This will reduce the requirement of doses of other drugs. It will provide balance anesthesia. And as the drug doses are reduced, the chances of adverse effect of those particular drugs can be reduced with this. So this is a context sensitive half time of a different anesthetic, uh, mainly the hypnotics and the analgesic. So if we look at the bottom, so it has been studied over eight hours in this particular graph. So if we see at the bottom, we have propofol, which is denoted by the yellow line and the remifentanil, which is by a blue line. In Even after eight hours with a constant infusion, you will see that the accumulation which is happening is very negligible. And that's the advantage that we get when we're using propofol, maybe supplemented with remifentanil um, as probably the ideal um, drug for the total intravenous anesthesia. Moving ahead, we'll first look at the propofol, which is a principal drug used for TIVA. It's a short-acting hypnotic agent which acts on the GABA receptors, widely used to induce and maintain anesthesia, uh, has a rapid onset and offset of action, and it allows a smooth transition during perioperative period. Many situations we use propofol alone, uh, along with uh, some regional blocks, which we'll be discussing in analgesia. So propofol can be uh, used in various ways when we are discussing uh, total intravenous anesthesia. Coming to opioids, they are utilized to provide analgesia because propofol does not have an analgesic property. So supplemental analgesia can be provided with fentanyl or remifentanil. Uh, obviously, they have, uh, it binds to the opioid receptors and modulates the pain. This reduces the requirement of analgesics during surgery and also reduces the requirement of propofol Fentanyl has definitely a much uh, larger context sensitive half time and when it is given uh, more than four hours in a continuous infusion at a constant state may delay the emergence significantly. Remifentanyl definitely will not have that uh, delay in the emergence when combined with the uh, propofol. Remifentanil is an ultra fast acting opioid easily titratable due to its rapid effect site equilibration. Advantages include its fast onset, fast offset, short context sensitive half time. Remifentanil is effective in reducing the propofol recoil almost by 40%. Disadvantages include in higher doses, it can cause respiratory depression, potential hyperalgesia, and can cause thoracic wall rigidity. Dexmedetomidine uh, is another additive. So if you are not using opioid or we want to use opioid sparing anesthesia or we want to use uh, opioid free anesthesia, dexmedetomidine is a good addition. It is an alpha-2 agonist. It has got sedative, anxiolytic and analgesic properties. The advantages include it has got less respiratory depression and opioid sparing effect. Uh, loading dose of 0.5 to 1 microgram per kg over 10 to 20 minutes can be given, followed by an infusion rate of 0.2 to 1 microgram per kg per hour. Due to the long context sensitive half time dextrumidin up to 250 minutes after an eight hour in, uh, infusion can delay the extubation and hence a uh, decreasing uh, infusion needs to be used when dextrumidin is used or it should be stopped well in advance. Ketamine, ketamine is a beautiful drug. Uh, we, we all have been using in different context. Uh, ketamine has uh, a very potent analgesic uh, action. It's a NMDA receptor antagonist, which is sedative and analgesic property, uh, causes less respiratory depression, which is an advantage along with causes bronchodilatation and provides excellent analgesia. Uh, it also maintains sympathetic tone, resulting uh, in improved hemodynamic stability. When used wisely uh, along with other drugs, it can be extremely useful in patients who are critically ill uh, or have cardiac morbidity, but it, that has to be used in a very cautious way. 
Ketamine can also be used as a sole anesthetic agent for TIVA in limited resource environment like uh, on-field anesthesia. Uh, ketamine also is a good agent uh, where we are using totally intravenous anesthesia, specifically in burns patient. The disadvantages include it increases the airway secretions, causes nausea, causes hallucinations postoperatively, and may interfere with the processed EEG monitoring. So these are the drugs that we discussed, propofol. Uh, I'm not going to discuss uh, the doses because these are routine doses. Uh, and these are manual infusion doses that we are discussing. So uh, as we progress, uh, we also need to have a look at these uh, excellent combinations. So these are the drugs which can be mixed together safely. So there's a lot of literature available. So ketamine and propofol can be mixed in one is to one propofol. 100 milligrams of propofol and 100 milligrams of propofol can be used and ketofol can be uh, prepared and uh, can be used as a simple intermittent bolus technique also. Ketodex is a combination of ketamine and dexmedetomidine. Ketomid is a combination of ketamine and midazolam. Uh, midazolam, fintan, and dexmedetomidine are also very compatible and does not cause any complication after mixing. Propofol, dexmedetomidine, fentanyl can be used. Uh, ketamine, propofol, dexmedetomidine can also be <coughs> mixed to form a KPD uh, formulation. And recently, remifentanil and propofol has been used. Why these drug mixes are important? Because when we are using multiple drugs to provide total intravenous anesthesia, uh, using multiple syringe pumps, it will be very difficult to be vigilantly monitoring every syringe pump. So to reduce the risk of errors and complications, mm -hmm. these techniques, uh, mm -hmm. these mixes are uh, used to, uh, you know, safeguard the patient. So along with the drugs, that, uh, propofol, uh, opioids, dexmedetomidine, and uh, vitamin, we can have midazolam, usually used as a pre-medicating agent. Uh, obviously, it's uh, requirement nowadays in modern anesthesia is mm -hmm. going down. But when used specifically in patients who are cardiac triple, may reduce the requirement of uh, ketamine, may reduce the requirement of propofol, and obviously reduce the complication associated. If we are looking at uh, opioid-free or opioid-sparing uh, anesthesia, magnesium sulfate and lignocaine can be good drugs to use uh, as a part of total intravenous anesthesia. Along with this, to provide good post-operative and interpretive analgesia, uh, three simple uh, modalities are used as a part of multimodal analgesia. One is dexamethasone, which is a potent anti-emetic drug and also good analgesic and anti-inflammatory, along with paracetamol. And uh, NSAIDs, usually diclofenac, which is preferred in perioperative period, provided it is uh, not contraindicated. Along with this, to provide the uh, uh, effective analgesia, different regional analgesia techniques or nerve blocks, um, uh, interfacial blocks are also being used nowadays. And that actually enhances the efficacy of analgesia, reduces the requirement of anesthetics. And overall recovery profile of total intervenesthesia is much, much better with this combination. So technique and models of total intravenous anesthesia. So our uh, total intravenous anesthesia, as we discussed, can be, you know, it can be used manually. So I can give uh, simple boluses intermittently and uh, uh, induce the patient and maintain the patient with that. So we are doing something that when you're using midazolam ketamine mixture or uh, ketamine propofol mixture, or we can have a fixed rate infusion, which is time variant. So irrespective of, uh, depending on the time, we change the uh, doses. And dose variation infusion, which we will see after this. Uh, the problem with manual infusion is we do not reach a constant plasma concentration of the drugs. Neither we maintain that over the time plane. So there is a risk of either underdosing or overdosing and inadequate depth of anesthesia. To counter that problem, uh, there is a modification of total intravenous anesthesia, which is also described as target control infusion or uh, simply called as TCI. So we will first look at the manual infusion. So for propofol, the uh, Bristol module, which was uh, described by Roberts in 1988, it says that after the induction of anesthesia with 2 to 2.5 milligram per kg dose of propofol, the initial infusion should be 10 milligram per kg per hour for first 10 minutes, followed by 8 milligram per kg per hour for next 10 minutes, followed by 6 milligram per kg per hour thereafter throughout the procedure. And the infusion should be stopped 10 to 20 minutes before expected uh, uh, commissioning uh, completion of the surgery. So when we are doing this, it is expected that the blood or the brain concentration of uh, uh, propofol 
remains between um, you know three to six uh, microgram per ml. Uh, the the tar normal target is three microgram per ml. Uh, so this is one module. But as we said that when we are using this module, uh, there is we are not using a TCI pump. So how much concentration we are achieving at the the predicted it can't be seen on the screen and depending on the stage of surgery the new stimulus maybe at the time of incubation incision or handling conversion of laparoscopy to open every time the depth of anesthesia will change and the frequent uh, boluses needs to be given when we are trying manual uh, total intravenous anesthesia and this can lead to either uh, under concentration or you know over concentration of the drugs and lead to the complications further so uh, coming to the uh, target control infusion system. So target control infusion system is again a syringe pump, but it has got provision to enter patient data in the form of age, weight, height, and gender of the patient. So understanding the pharmaco dynamics uh, uh, of the patient, a pharma pharmacokinetic model is prepared to achieve a certain plasma concentration or an effect site that is a brain concentration. So when we define a particular concentration in plasma or brain, we anticipate that at one particular point, there will be equilibration between the plasma concentration and the brain concentration, and a constant state of anesthesia can be uh, maintained. So it utilizes computer-based algorithms uh, to calculate and administer the drug to achieve and maintain a desired plasma or effect site concentration, incorporating patient-specific parameters as I already mentioned. So TCI systems can individualize the drug administration and optimize the depth of anesthesia. So this models, the pharmacokinetic models, are derived from extensive clinical data describe, uh, and describe the specific intravenous agents absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. So this is something which is uh, having a significant impact nowadays to improve the quality of total intravenous anesthesia and uh, achieve a very steady state of anesthesia throughout the surgical procedure. So there are various models which are described. So these are pharmacokinetic models and uh, depending on the drug. So when it comes to propofol, uh, for adult patients, there is a MARSH uh, model. So MARSH model is something which is about uh, plasma concentration. So when we are setting up the uh, TCI for MARSH model, we are looking at achieving a target plasma concentration. When we are looking at the Snyder model, it, it is guiding us to set up a uh, brain that is effect site concentration. The Kataria and Pedifuser um, uh, pharmacokinetic models are specifically uh, prepared for the pediatric patients. And uh, for remifentanil, the most commonly used uh, model is Minto model. Which, uh, for uh, dexmedetomidine, recently Dyke and Honeywood Colin model has been uh, accepted and is now available to use. So these are the various models that we can use when we are uh, performing uh, TCI uh, for total intravenous anesthesia. So we need pumps to deliver total, total intravenous anesthesia. So uh, as we said, manual infusions can be given. So when we are trying manual infusions, we can use IV set, which are connected to specialized IV connectors for total intravenous anesthesia. Our routine syringe pumps can be used to deliver a fixed rate of uh, transfusion of drugs uh, throughout the period. But uh, to have more advanced uh, technique, we need TIVA TCI pumps. So these are advanced syringe pumps with pharmacokinetic models, which we recently saw. So these are different manufacturers like BD, which has got LRS PK, or uh, Presenis Cabi has got Injectamate or Agilia TIVA. Uh, Acromate is uh, one of the new. Uh, a pump which is available. It has got uh, pharmacokinetic models almost for all uh, different uh, drugs, including the dexmedetomidine, and uh, it has got almost all possible models for uh, adult and pediatric. So that is something which is a uh, good investment for those who are considering total intravenous anesthesia for their patients. So these are the various pumps that we are seeing on the screen. Uh, at the upper level, we have single uh, TCI system. Then we have a uh, system for the two pumps. Then we have a system for the three pumps. And we have separate uh, adjustments or inputs uh, uh, for these. And at the bottom, what we see is again a two syringe uh, system, but we have a single uh, input system for this. So when we are uh, dealing with total intravenous anesthesia, there is always a concern, concern of uh, awareness under anesthesia. Um, so we have to ensure that there is a 
adequate depth of anesthesia which is maintained and for which we need uh, monitoring systems. So these monitoring systems are nothing but uh, EEG uh, monitors. So they, this is called as processed EEG. So from a uh, particular uh, part of the brain or the scar, the sensors are attached. Uh, these are uh, non-piercing sensors. So they collect the data from uh, the particular EEG, which is processed and a measurable numerical number of that activity, brain activity is given. So as we know, bispectral index is most commonly used uh, monitor. Along with that, we have said line from Massimo. Uh, entropy is also there. And recently, Conax has also uh, come in the market and is being used by many of us. So coming to the conduct of total intravenous anesthesia and the safe total intravenous uh, total TIVA practice. So uh, th these are the basic requirements. So what we need is we need an IV cannula. So that IV cannula has to be visible as far as possible. And uh, at the uh, top of the screen, we see uh, a special connector. Uh, this connector has got an anti-reflux valve so that the drug that we are giving will not go into the uh, IV line. And uh, we, we have two connectors where uh, anti-siphon valves are there. So here the drugs are attached. And uh, we have to connect this as close to the patient as possible so that the dead space remains low. We need infusion pumps as we already described. Uh, we need effect site monitoring in the pro in the form of processed EEG monitors. And we also need clinical monitoring in terms of basic uh, vital parameters that we always do. So this is important uh, for the conduct of a total intravenous anesthesia. But when it comes to the safety, uh, there are certain things which need to be considered specifically for those centers which are not practicing TIVA regularly. Uh, or who those who want to start a TIVA as uh, part of their practice. These are the recommendations which are, uh, you know, given in 2018. And uh, these guidelines say that the anesthetist who is practicing TIVA should be trained in the and should be competent in the delivery of uh, TIVA. Uh, when general anesthesia is to be maintained by propofol infusion, use of target control infusion is recommended but not mandatory. It depends on the availability of the resource. Starting target concentration should be chosen depending on the characteristics of the patient, co-administered drugs, and clinical situation. Within an anesthetic department, it is preferable to stock only one concentration because as we know, propofol comes in 1% and 2% uh, concentration. So if we have both the concentration available and by mistake, a wrong concentration is aspirated, it definitely can lead to a major complication. The infusion state through which TIVA is delivered should have a lure lock connector. So that there are no disconnection because if disconnection happens unknowingly, the drug delivery will be affected and the depth of anesthesia will definitely be uh, very light. And that can lead to again another complication and it should definitely have an anti-siphon valve and anti-reflux valve. Uh, drug and fluid lines uh, should be joined as close to the patient as possible to reduce the dead space as we discussed and the use of administration set specifically designed for TIVA are recommended. Now, infusion pump, uh, whichever we are using and the syringes we are using, they should be calibrated for each other and uh, use of processed EEG is recommended, especially when we are using neuromuscular blockade because that is the uh, situation where we may not get early signs of you know, awareness and anesthesia. And when you are practicing a total intravenous anesthesia outside the operation theater, the SAID uh, standards should be practiced even there to safeguard the patient. Though there are a lot of advantages that we saw, there are certainly certain uh, some disadvantages of total intra-anesthesia. It definitely needs a dedicated venous line. So what is recommended is we should have a dedicated venous line for the delivery of the drugs. And we should have another uh, line for uh, administration of the IV fluids. Um, if we have a proximal vein specifically and we are using propofol as the uh, main anesthetic, it can cause pain on injection. Risk of bacterial contamination is there if you're using propofol for a longer time. Uh, we do not have a system currently which is easily available to monitor the blood concentration of these agents. Uh, delivery problems may go unrecognized if there are disconnections of the IV is you know uh, extravasated and that can cause problems. It needs specialized equipment that is specialized infusion pump for the delivery of the drugs. Less training available for TIVA techniques, and that is an disadvantage which goes against the use of TIVA. Uh, drug requires metabolism for clearance. This is against the you know the clearance of uh, des desflurane uh, that has been described. There is a potential for disconnection, and which can lead to the risk of awareness. 
So we'll uh, look at the spatial cohort of the patient. Firstly, we'll uh, look at obese patients. So available pharmacokinetic models are likely to be inaccurate for obese patients. Mars model can only be programmed up to the weight of 150 kg, uh, whereas the Snyder model, so this is about the protocol, Snyder model will only accept BMI less than 35 in female and less than 42 in male. So if we are dealing with a patient whose weight is more than 150 kg or BMI is more than 35 in females or more than 42 in males, the uh, these defined pharmacokinetic models may not be accurate and may cause uh, inadequate drug delivery. So <clears throat> uh, what we should be doing? Should we go by weight? So if you are going by weight of the patient, uh, there is still a lack of evidence whether one should use actual or ideal body weight in a prolonged surgery. <clears throat> So what is advised by obesity and bariatric anesthesia society is to use uh, processed EEG monitoring in these patients to define and uh, adjust the delivery of the uh, intravenous anesthetic for proclivinous uh, intravenous anesthesia. Coming to TY in pediatric patient, it is a growing concept. Um, many uh, pediatric patients are now receiving total intravenous anesthesia provides a number of advantages which are equivalent to the advantages that we saw in uh, adult patient. Uh, TIVA is very difficult to standardize in pediatric patient as compared to adult because of the um, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic variations and practical differences across the various age ranges and requires a very specific knowledge and training to allow its safe use. So this is a challenge and very only trained and competent people should be uh, you know, practicing TIVA in pediatric patients if you are using TCI. Uh, so there are uh, two most widely used and validated pediatric TCI programs. Uh, we have seen this in earlier slide, Pedicure and Cataria models. So Pedicure is suitable for uh, one year to 16 years old patients with uh, five to 61 kg weight. Uh, this is basically a variant of Marsh model. So if we have an adolescent whose weight is more than 61 kg, a simple uh, conversion to Marsh model can be used in those patients. The Cataria model is suitable for use in children between uh, 3 to 15 years of age and uh, those who weigh between 15 to 61 kg. Both models target the plasma propofol concentration and not the effect site concentration at brain. And initial target concentration to be achieved is 5 to 6 microgram ml. Uh, normal is adequate for rapid induction of anesthesia. So this target is equivalent to the adult patient. So when we look at the uh, uh, propofol as the main uh, anesthetic agent and when we are trying to set the uh, uh, plasma concentration or effect site concentration, our target uh, usually in a uh, young, healthy, middle-aged uh, muscular patient is uh, between 4 to 6 uh, microgram per ml. So that is the target. So usually what we do is we keep it around 5, 5.5. If the patient is very muscular, then we go to 5.5 to 6. And uh, if you are using uh, adjuvants like uh, dexmedetomidine or fentanyl, or if you are using, uh, we'll be using remifentanyl as it will be available now uh, very soon uh, in our country. So there the target comes down to 2.5 to 4 microgram per ml. Uh, however, using this, these models in critical patients, frail patients, all related patients will be difficult and uh, may cause uh, uh, cardiorespiratory uh, complications. So what is recommended in those patients is we start with uh, one microgram uh, per ml uh, concentration and slowly increase that uh, plasma concentration and see the clinical response. And depending on that, you said, so it's going to be a very slow induction, but uh, complications can be avoided. So this is where we stand currently. This is what uh, we have in our hand and what is new. So there are new drugs. There's n number of drugs which are being researched, which are being, uh, you know, in, in trial phase. Two drugs that I would like to discuss right now is one is remimazolam. It is a promising for procedural sedation and anesthesia. Pharmacologically, it is a benzodiazepine, but it is differentiated by its ester group and rapid metabolism by tissue esterase. So uh, easy metabolism can happen. And uh, it has got a very less uh, active metabolite. So uh, remnant in the plasma is also less. It is a rapid pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic relatively small effects of uh, various such as age, gender, race, obesity, physical status, weight. So for almost all types of patient, it will be a very stable and, uh, you know, rapid onset and rapid offset drug. And it will make uh, it a perfect addition to uh, TIVA medication regimen. 
which will be available hopefully in enzyme times. Uh, ciprofol, it is again a GABA receptor antagonist. It is a phenon derivative of propofol. Uh, it has got improved pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic characters. Uh, it has got rapid rate of onset and recovery in preclinical experiments. It is five times more potent than propofol. Does not cause pain on intravenous injection. That is again an advantage. Provides better hemodynamic stability. It is better in prolonged infusion due to rapid clearance. It can be given in initial doses of 0.4 mg per kg for 30 seconds and followed by supplements of 0.1 mg per kg for 10 seconds or a maintenance infusion dose of 0.1 to 0.3 mg per kg per hour can be used. So these are the two drugs. There are a number of drugs which are uh, enlisted uh, in the literature right now, but uh, their addition to our uh, uh, bucket will take some time. Now coming to something called as closed loop uh, TCI. So this is a further next step of target control infusion. So in target control infusion, just to revise what we do is we set a plasma concentration or brain concentration depending on the pharmacokinetic model and we deliver the drug accordingly. And in, whenever in doubt, we use a depth of anesthesia monitor to ensure that there is an adequacy of anesthesia. This closed loop system, what it does that it incorporates this depth of anesthesia monitors, which are processed EEG monitors with the delivery system. So it creates a loop, loop between the syringe pump, which is delivering the drug to the patient blood, uh, going to the brain and at the brain, we check the signals and whatever is the depth of anesthesia. For example, if you're using BIS and if we set the system in a way where we want the BIS number between 40 to 60, any variation outside this will give positive or negative feedback to the infusion pump and will adjust the depth of anesthesia accordingly. So this is an emerging technology. It uses real-time monitoring of the patient variable, such as biospectral index or entropy, to guide the drug administration in an automated way. The feedback loop enables precise control of anesthesia depth. So it becomes uh, in it, uh, theoretically, it becomes independent of the anesthesia provider and depends directly on the feedback or the inputs received from the patient assessment. So uh, this is an interesting uh, article uh, which is uh, which talks about MaxLipi. So it is an automated closed loop anesthesia delivery system. Uh, so it is uh, first robo in anesthesia, we can say. So this particular system, it is not only assessing the hypnosis, but it also assessing the analgesia and neuromuscular blockade. So it uses bispectral index to assess the uh, variation in the hypnosis. It uses analgo score for analgesia and it uses phonomyography for a neuromuscular blockade. So uh, depending on these three parameters, the there will be variation in uh, the use. For example, if you're using propofol, uh, atracidium and uh, remifentanil. So the doses will be adjusted accordingly depending on the feedback. So this is a, a primary model. And this is how the, you know, this is a, uh, more of a representative model, how it sees. So on the right hand, the box, you can see there is an infusion pump at the top, which is going to the patient and patient feedback is collected in the back sleepy through this monitor, through the vital signs, ventilator setting, surgical feed, and also they are using a webcam. So that is also used as a, uh, so this is the first report of, uh, you know, such feedback based uh, closed loop anesthesia system that we had. And this is also, this is described as uh, anesthesia robot 2. So closed loop TIVA system with the set line as a basic monitor. So similar kind of monitoring which is going on and a feedback is used to adjust the depth of anesthesia and other parameters accordingly in an automated way. So this is uh, another development. This is eye control RP anesthesia robot. So RP is for remifentanil and propofol. So we can see the two syringe pumps uh, next to the anesthesia machine below the right hand screen monitor. So one is for propofol and the other one is for uh, remifentanil. So these two are getting automatically delivered to the patient, collecting the feedback and the depth is managed accordingly. So this is something which is going to be the future. We'll discuss about this. But coming to this, another interesting article in uh, published in 2020. Uh, so comparison of predicted and real propofol and remifentanil concentration in plasma and brain tissue during target control in treatment. So this is first of its kind study where around 38 neurosurgical patients were included. Uh, 
out of these nine patients underwent epilepsy surgery. So sample of excised brain from those nine epilepsy patients were retained. And when the <laughs> brain tissues were uh, excised, uh, at the same time, single arterial blood sample was also obtained. And that brain tissue and blood sample was tested for the concentration of propofol and uh, remifentanil. So this is a descriptive chart of the same. And so this is a first to compare propofol remifentanil plasma and brain concentration, giving insight into the accuracy of TCI pharmacokinetics. So see, what we're doing, we are going by an assumption that depending on the pharmacokinetic uh, uh, data we have, we have developed these models. And we um, are depending on those models, we are um, administering propofol, remifentanil, or fentanyl, dexmedetomidine. And we assume that the depth is uh, achieved in a proper way. And whenever in doubt, we use either BIS or something uh, to assess the depth of anesthesia. But what is actually happening with the blood and brain, this study is give, giving us some uh, idea. So uh, here they have used Minto model for uh, remifentanil. What it says that uh, it actually <clears throat> underestimates the plasma concentration and tend to overestimate the brain concentration. And Marsh model is used for the propofol where the concentration uh, was higher in brain compared to the plasma. So these conflicting results show that the effect side concentration of anesthetic drug during equilibrium cannot be assumed to be equal and further studies are uh, you know, suggested after this study. Now coming to the multivariable control that we just saw. So multivariable means we are not relying only on processed EEG, but we are also looking at the muscle relaxation. We are also looking at the reflexes. We are also looking at the vital parameters and analgesia. So control of anesthesia cannot be done based on feedback of a single measurable output. This is what the study says. And there are several challenges which are discussed in this study and it mentions that it's complex, you know, to form uh, an automated anesthesia delivery system. And it specifically mentions that such a device may not be ready in less than 20 to 30 years. However, they also put a note saying that nonetheless, numerous advance, uh, advances have been witnessed in recent year. So increasingly reliable measurement of robust and adaptive controller uh, and a better system can also be expected in early times. So this is where we are going. This is where we are heading. But coming back to the current time, what we should do. So uh, total intervals anesthesia has its advantages. So what I would like to uh, say that we all should find appropriate indications for total intravenous anesthesia. We should start practicing it as and when possible. We can have combinations of propofol, fentanyl, propofol, ketamine, ketamine, fentanyl, or ketamine, midazolam, such combinations with dexmedetomidine as a background adjunct and try and see the change, change in the outcome of the patient. Ultimately, what matters is how well the patient is recovering, um, the clear-headed recovery, you know, patient goes back to his daily activities comparatively early, even after the brain surgeries uh, in, in properly, you know, selective cases. So we need to see the change and we need to be the change, you know, to practice this uh, particular uh, technique of anesthesia and pass on the benefits of this technique to our patients. So uh, when it comes to the practice, because uh, practicing total intervention anesthesia is a difficult task. So there are certain modalities which are available. So there are certain apps like ITWA plus app, or there's anesthesia infuser calculator, which helps us in calculating the doses or IV calculator is also there. Then uh, TWA manager is another app. And there are two websites. One is TWA trainer and another one is uh, Rublu. So these websites can also help us in understanding the basics of TWA, the drug adjustments, and probably help us in you know using that in our clinical practice. So before I conclude, uh, my take home message is total intravenous anesthesia is effective, safe and reliable technique. It has many advantages over current practice of volatile anesthesia based uh, balance anesthesia. Ongoing research will change the way anesthesia is administered in future and probably TIVA may become the technique of choice. However, the current form of TIVA itself is very promising in terms of all stated advantages and the patient outcomes. Addition of remifentanil in our armamentarium as it is getting introduced in our country will make the practice of TIVA more attractive. All anesthetists should learn, acquire and propagate this technique and safety norms prescribed as per the guidelines given in 2018 must be religiously followed to ensure the patient's safety. 
So there are uh, these are certain societies uh, of total intravenous anesthesia. You we have Euro Siva uh, Society, World Siva Society, and uh, now in India we have this association of uh, target control infusion and total intravenous anesthesia uh, logist, which has been formed and registered recently. So uh, we also have our own association uh, now, which has been uh, you know uh, founded and promoted by uh, Dr. Kushar Choksi and uh, the team. And uh, this is what you know brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you for patient listening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vikas. So, except for the initial few moments of uh, technical issues, I apologize uh, uh, to all the participants. So, despite advances in everything, including TCA. So we had problems related to online uh, programs even at this point of time. Thanks on, once again. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Vikas. Thank you. Sir. And uh, today we have had a very nice mixture of uh, seniors and uh, young uh, anesthesia the PGs also participating. Uh, in fact, I have uh, Dr. Pankaj Gupta, I can see here, uh, Dr. Venkatagiri, Dr. Bala Bande, uh, then uh, Dr. Mangesh, Dr. Surya Rao, and there are multiple seniors also uh, who are listening to your presentation and many postgraduates also apart from consultants. So as you said, it is almost like a revolution in the sense we are getting more and more exposure to total intravenous anesthesia in the background of uh, reports related to inhalation agents. So there are always problems related to nitrous oxide, where we have to use it judiciously. We have problems with respect to depletion of ozone layers by agents like desflurane and sevoflurane and the problems of scavenging in a country like India. So, so many issues are always uh, still there. So, advent of TIVA is a very good uh, development for anesthesia across the world. And as you say, we have to get trained uh, basically in how to use it. The training probably would start by using only IV drugs and trying to avoid inhalation agents per se. Uh, so the most important part, as you said, is trying to understand the PKPD aspect, the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics related to each of the drugs. So for the benefit of PDs, uh, I'm just repeating that we must be masters in the pharmacokinetics of the drugs so that we understand the pharmacodynamics. And most important consideration uh, for actually the uh, more balanced TIVA would be using of depth of anesthesia monitoring. Uh, so this is the background of uh, the presentation. And as uh, Dr. Vikas has said, uh, much of these are based upon uh, multiple evidences related to usage in different uh, sets of patients, age-wise, weight-wise, uh, pathology-wise and all. And all of them are compiled together and uh, computer programming is used and you have got different types of regimen. So these are the different uh, basic things. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, we have touched upon many of the agents which we regularly used. Of course, propofol and uh, fentanyl is most commonly used in India. Uh, and uh, happy to note that there is a uh, uh, Dexmed related regimen is also getting introduced. So, ha have there been any publications, uh, Dr. Vikas, related to Dexmetomedy, STIVA or TCS? For TCS, uh, we don't have those detailed uh, publications yet, sir. Perfect. Okay. So, just TCS is not available. No uh, regimen is available for TCS as of now. Yes. Right? For uh, Dexmetomedy. And we have got some specific ones for pediatric age group. They are also basically added recently. But there is some, uh, always we must understand, as he has rightly put, that we have to understand the peculiarities related to the anatomy and physiology related to the pediatric age group. And at the other extreme, we also have to be careful with elderly patients and obese patients. So that is another consideration. Yes. So Lignocaine, you did mention, uh, I think it's a one one which is largely unexplored. Unexplored in the sense it's a drug which is so easily available. 
uh, cheap, uh, and there are publications related to uh, perioperative use of lignocaine, either as part of TIVA or as part of a balanced anesthesia of inhalation agents, uh, with multiple good uh, outcomes, like it reduces the requirement of analgesia, sedatives, and uh, lesser POIV and other things. So, do you think uh, we should be using lignocaine as a continuous infusion more frequently? Any idea from your side? Uh, sir, I would say that probably uh, right now what we are practicing is more of fentanyl or dexmedetomidine or combination of both and yeah. propofol as background. So, yeah. unless we are having situation where that appears to be inadequate, maybe we can use that. But as long as we have uh, fentanyl and dexmedetomidine having being more effective, probably we need not explore that because it also has got its own shortcomings when it comes to the, you know, its cardiac effects and even the central effects. Yeah, I understand. I just brought up the question because even yesterday, I was able to find the systematic reviews on use of lignocaine in pediatric patients also as an infusion. Yes. And largely it was also found to be safer uh, in terms of usage and outcomes. Right. So it has got some potential. So it has yeah. <laughs> it is just like uh, probably magnesium sulfate, yeah. you know, which is a non-anesthetic agent and adds so much of, you know, advantage when we are using it. You know, we go yes. down on the dose requirement. Uh, it itself provides analysis. The same happens with uh, xylocaine when it is used. Yes. Uh, my experience with xylocaine is very limited. So we have used in selective cases, but it is very limited. Okay. That's, that's important. It will be very useful if there are some... So some consultants have been found to be using it regularly. Uh, yes, sometimes we, we overlook some of the basic drugs, but we have to wait for, as you say, clear-cut evidences. And there is a question from Dr. Naveed. I think you have addressed it already, but what he has uh, written is drug strength ratio required for mixture of drugs. So you can just answer that question. What he implies is, how do you get into the ratio? Or drug combinations. So as we mentioned, uh, uh, the most commonly used combination is uh, uh, ketamine and propofol, where we are using the uh, one is to one uh, combination. Yeah. Um, others, uh, it, it depends on uh, which drug we are using. I think he has mentioned about MDF. So yeah. if we are looking at uh, MDF. Uh, the concentration would be like um, that is something which is more of a theoretical mention, but I'll just try to uh, recall. MDF would be um, so midazolam. Normally, we uh, use uh, half the strain, so maybe uh, half midazolam and one microgram point point zero five uh, milligram um, uh, milligram per kg of midazolam and. Uh, uh, dexmedetomidine in one microgram per kg and uh, fentanyl usually equivalent to the dexmedetomidine that is one microgram per kg. So that is something can be combination of uh, MDF, he specifically asked. Similarly, if we are mixing uh, propofol and fentanyl, so propofol 1% uh, we use and uh, fentanyl we try and prepare the mixture uh, where uh, the strength of the fentanyl is 10 microgram per ml. So uh, that is something which uh, can be used. And KPD is something which is uh, practiced by many of us uh, in short procedures. So that is ketamine, propofol, and dexmedetomidine. So usually it is uh, one is to one is to one combination. So 0.5 milligram of uh, ketamine, uh, 0.5 milligram of uh, um, propofol, and uh, dexmedetomidine again 0.5 microgram. And uh, the it is given per kg per hour combination. So, various combinations can be made. Yeah. So, I think uh, many of them are evidence-based. and But, of course, as a practitioner, you are, you, you are advised to titrate. Yes. Right? So, yes, based sir. upon clinical endpoints, and if you are indeed using depth of anesthesia monitoring, we are going to use it. That's always there. Yes. Then, uh, Dr. Jay Prakash has asked about remifentanil. And do you see any advantages of remifentanil over fentanyl? Uh, definitely, see, we haven't used. We are waiting for it. Maybe uh, next month we will probably have the opportunity to use it. And uh, uh, 
uh, fentanyl uh, definitely as we uh, discussed that uh, the context sensitive uh, half time is uh, very high especially after 4 hours so uh, there is accumulation and can cause delay in emergence but uh, right now what we are using for uh, for fentanyl is we use uh, 2 microgram per kg as a bolus uh, by and large followed by for first 30 minutes we use 2 microgram per kg per hour infusion for next one hour we use uh, 1.5 microgram per kg per hour and after that we use 1 microgram per kg per hour and after 4 hours if needed we reduce it to 0.5 so this is what we are doing but this is just a uh, you know uh, based on few uh, articles which are available and our uh, clinical experience uh, we do not have any you know standardization for this uh, specifically when we are using tiva for coliosis correction uh, we can't go down so much we have to maintain at least 1 to 1.5 microgram per kg per hour of fentanyl to provide a very uh, stable uh, hemodynamics but in spite of that even after 6 7 hours surgery the we never had an issue uh, with extubation of scoliosis patient but fentanyl will definitely change uh, the intraoperative status only thing is we'll have to learn how we are going to manage the post operative pain because once yeah. we do to the fentanyl there will be you know um, a major issue for us which yeah. is a beauty of fentanyl that's what we have to learn. It's, it's like switch on switch off type of analgesia. Right. So abrupt recovery from analgesic effect, we have to learn how to counter it also. So it's always a matter of continuing or trying to know when to stop. That's more important. Of course, uh, he's asked about propofol uh, syndrome, injection syndrome, but I, okay, during TIVA infusion, you can just take it. Do you see propofol infusion syndrome during TIVA? Ah. Uh... In in our practice, we have seen only in one case. That uh -huh. was also not very conclusive, but uh, because we could not uh, relate it to anything else, uh, that that is what we had, uh, you know, concluded that it is probably a propofol uh, infusion syndrome. So it was a um, typical outcome after probably some eight hours of surgery uh, that had happened. But that was the only incident that we see. It is definitely a truth, though it is very rare. Uh, we should be, you know, prepared to anticipate that. Yeah. So, in fact, you are active in neuro anesthesia. So, would you advise, like, see, infusion syndrome is more likely in an ICU patient. We yes. are, are going to use it for more than 24 hours. And all. So, you advise a depth of, uh, uh, like, I mean, using bizarre entropy in the ICU also for this set of patients? Ideally, yes. Ideally, yes. Yeah. But practically, I don't know whether that will be feasible. Yeah. Yeah, practically it's not being followed. Uh, I mean, in the sense we are not seen this basically. So yes. not that that much of dosing is never reached. So indeed, theoretically speaking, if you indeed want to control it, you can put some bizarre entropy monitoring for sedation, especially in the background of neuro neurological neuropathology also. Yes. That that could be the basis, right? Uh, Dr. Venkatagiri sir has asked about. Can you switch out from ISO-CO2 dexmedomidine propofol ketamine for major cases? But gripping narcotics is difficult in Kerala. We can. We can. In uh, a few cases, even we are practicing that. Uh, yeah. For example, for uh, thoracoscopy, uh, mainly VAT-assisted uh, surgeries, uh, we are preferably using total intravenous anesthesia. So what we do there is we use, uh, if we have many times to use fentanyl, but we have used dexmedetomidine in, in those situations. And uh, we use ketamine as supplement, usually 0.2 to 0.25 milligram per kg bolus specifically before the surgical uh, stimulus. And this is the only uh, bolus that we usually give. And that really works well. Uh, uh, dexmedetomidine also reduces the requirement of propofol and also enhances post-operative analgesia. But if we could add uh, some regional block, like for thoracoscopy, we use either uh, uh, erector spiny or paravertebral block, or we in, in uh, thoracoscopic cases, we use only um, uh, intercostal block. So that also you know, reduces the requirement of uh, um, opioids. So, so definitely we can switch over to that. Maybe there will be some a small learning curve, but it is doable definitely. Yeah. So Dr. Giri, you are there? Yes, sir. 
I'm there. Yeah. So there is a break in your I'm, voice. I'm there. Yeah. Now we are heard. So indeed, it is possible, as Dr. Vikas is telling, there is a small learning curve for any new set of combinations uh, when we are not able to get fentanyl and we are not happy using our traditional, I mean, uh, narcotics like uh, pentazosine or pethidine or morphine. Uh, as you say, in a smaller setup or when monitoring is a risk factor, we can develop the right combination of using midazolam or dexmedomidine or ketamine with propofol. So I think that could be the answer, Dr. Vikas. Yes. So KDF uh, can be um, used. KDP can be used. So uh -huh. we can pre-mix it and use it. Or maybe we can uh, keep them separate, use it in infusion. And uh, ketamine can be used in a form of only boluses. So that uh, intensifies even the surgical analgesia. Only thing you said it, it, it also uh, takes care of uh, you know, some bradycardia or hypertension that may happen when we're using dexmedidine and propofol together. So ketamine can uh, you know, um, balance that out. Yeah, that's a very important uh, point because one of the risk factors of uh, dexmedidine. So even if you are careful enough, there is always a risk of a significant bradycardia and hypertension at some point of time. Yes. Or in uh, very unusual situations, which you go by the descriptions related to pharmacokinetics, there can be initial hypertension, which can uh, go to extreme high levels, could malignant hypertension levels. Somebody could go to 230, 40, or 160, 180. So monitoring, there is nothing about, I mean, there is no compromise on monitoring. So that's important, as you say. And uh, Dr. Venkatagiri is endowed with a good... Uh, 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 support from the government also. So I can always suggest that even depth of anesthesia monitoring can be obtained uh, in your setup. We, 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 we have already got to do depth of anesthesia monitoring. Ah, it has already come, right. No, no, I am retiring. I wanted to be in my private practice. Uh, private uh, that, that's yeah. what, see, my, my major guests are uh, PCNL or uh, lap hysterectomy, lap polycystectomy, not uh, orthopedic uh, in GA. My GA guests are uh, like this. So instead of SEVO and ISO, switching over to other drugs, that's what I'm thinking that to keep them in uh, depth of anesthesia. Correct. Yeah. Dr. Bondi, sir, has, uh, okay. Dr. Sumit has asked, can we use EVA in uh, liver function deranged yes, patients? Yes. Of course, of course. That is probably now... Uh, a preferred uh, technique, uh, especially for those patients who are undergoing uh, hepatic tummies or those who are going uh, liver resection or even for the transplant, because propofol is uh, the agent which you know uh, maintains the liver perfusion to its best as compared to the volatile agents, and uh, recovery profile is very good. So even in our center, uh, our team, which is involved in the uh, liver transplant and other uh, hepatobiliary surgeries, propofol based totally intravenous anesthesia supplemented by uh, fentanyl remains the uh, first choice of technique. Would it be uh, effect side concentration target or it could be the plasma uh, concentration? Plasma concentration. Yeah, theoretically it would be better, right? Yes, yes. We are talking about uh, metabolism and the liver being affected. True. Better to depend upon plasma concentration target as compared to effect side concentration. And uh, whenever in doubt, we use base in those patients. So that is a part of the practice now. Okay. Dr. Lakshman Reddy has commented that we are using ketamine and propofol for major spine and neurophysiological monitoring. This works good in post-operative pain also. Yes. And uh, we also use uh, this technique specifically those cases where we are not getting the good uh, uh, signals when we are doing the neurophysiological, moni uh, neurophysiological monitoring. So ketamine acts as a you know uh, excitator and uh, enhances the quality of the signal. So that is again added advantage in those cases where we are doing interoperative neuro uh, monitoring. Okay. Actually, the uh, the the last slide you showed was very good in terms of the evidence, like a more direct evidence. You you talked about the brain tissue being uh, taken up and studied in terms of uh, the propofol 
uh, being used as part of the regime. But uh, of course, you would have a lot of information would be got. Yes. I think, uh, but it is basically a diseased brain. Yes. A diseased brain in the sense, uh, especially uh, related to the perfusion and uh, the mean arterial pressure based uh, supplies and everything. So there could be a small confounding uh, uh, part there. That is there. So actually, uh, in that study, when I had the same doubt when I read that for the first yeah. time, so yeah. they had a total 38 uh, patients from where the brain tissues were removed. Out of this, only nine patients had uh, no pathology. So it was for the epilepsy. So either there was a scar. So that was a healthy, uh, close to the healthy brain. Okay. So only those nine patients' brain uh, uh, levels were assessed. And uh, remaining uh, 29 patients' uh, brain tissues were not included in the study. So nine patients is a very small uh, sample size, we can say. But at least we have a first-hand evidence now. Yeah. Which was lacking. Yeah, that's a very important concept. And uh, in fact, two of the postgraduates in uh, my institution are doing studies with the TCI. Okay. Uh, they are using uh, the Schneider model. Mm. Uh, one is for uh, laparoscopic procedures. Okay, trying to assess uh, the effect on the hemodynamic parameters. The other one is on uh, middle ear surgeries. Uh, to assess the blood loss. Both of them have got two groups. Uh, uniformly, it is propofol. Um, and the groups are based upon one group receiving uh, fentanyl, the other group receiving dexmetomidine. Okay. As a bolus and infusion, hmm. not TCA. TCA is pure propofol. Okay. Uh, in both the groups. Okay. So, of course, before starting the study about a year ago, one and a half years ago, so there was a lot of input taken from experts like you. And they were also sent for some training, like workshops and all. And uh, they have, uh, even though they have got some complaint to me <laughs> as a guide, uh, they are there here, students. Okay, they are there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, Sumit, you can speak out on uh, the problem you had. Can speak, Dr. Smith. Yes. Voice is not heard. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Uh, so, uh, like uh, we had uh, our thesis topic as uh, Tiva, sir, in uh, laparoscopic surgeries, where we compare. Uh, uh, infusion of dexmed with fentanyl uh, with common TCA profile in both the groups. Uh, initially, we had the problem like uh, as the surgeries were prolonged, uh, like the uh, pa uh, patients were, uh, uh, I mean, uh, extubated in deep, deeper plates. And also, like, uh, there were uh, problems of uh, uh, hypertension, bradycardia uh, in the dexmed intermediate groups. Uh, later, like uh, after uh, discussions, like uh, when when to use glycoperlite, when to use mefentramine, uh, we had like uh, defined defined the uh, what is bradycardia and what is uh, uh, hypertension, and uh, we have uh, made solution for those. So, uh, initially, like uh, even uh, using entropy, uh, like we had uh, initially problem in uh, adjusting entropy with this like uh, effect side concentration. Later, with uh, many other uh, study, uh, like thesis, uh, I mean, uh, uh, other uh, uh, data, like uh, uh, we managed to solve these problems. Okay, what he wants to convey is basically initially uh, the problem in terms of when to stop the fentanyl infusion, yes. fentanyl and expand infusion, and uh, as as per the available evidences, uh, I think uh, you stopped at the uh, closure of the port, yes, right? A removal of the trocar, sir. Yes. Removal of the trocar, all the trocars. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. What was the rate of uh, background infusion? Sir, uh, uh, 0.5 mics per kg per hour, sir. Okay. Uh, and it was uh, preceded by a uh, 2 mics uh, per kg in bolus, right? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, no, 1.5 mics per kg, sir. like okay. over 10 minutes. Sir. There are 
there are some limitations of even uh, Snyder and even now uh, Mars yeah, that is getting uh -huh. addressed now with the new models actually. Yeah. So there Can are I give a practical tip, sir? Um, Please. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, hello, Vikas. As always, uh, good to uh, hear me, listen to you. Thank you. So this uh, uh, TIVA in private, uh, being a private practitioner, we have always been using it in various ways over the years. Now, regarding this, uh, this uh, uh, what a student mentioned about bradycardia, I mean, I, I have a habit of whenever I give propofol to any patient, I always take around 25 mics of ketamine. So the side effects of propofol are taken care of, the brady, the hypotension. So same I, am, I do with dex medicine. Oh. I use dex a lot for all pediatric cases especially. And uh, I always give it along with ketamine. Oh. So the contract, the beneficial and the uh, side effects of each drug are taken care of. So I feel we in private practice get used to uh, you know, practical solutions for everything. So even for this uh, study that you're doing, sir, I'll suggest add one milligram of, uh, about 50 milligrams of ketamine to the uh, infusion pump and you will not have this bradycardia problem that a student had, sir. Just a practical suggestion. Yeah, I understand. So you, you, uh, you say ketamine. Right. So probably it will be a choice for our next PG because this is an ongoing study. Now we cannot change the protocol. Right. So we we'll keep your input in mind, sir, definitely. And Dr. Lakshman Reddy, are you will you be able to just give that input? You have commented that Schneider and Marsh may not be the good models at all. Yeah, uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, as for the literature, Marsh and Schneider both are done on volunteers and they are healthy patients. Yeah. Whereas uh, what we are doing surgeries are the patients. And uh, so right now we are using only a level model, which has done on large population and based on variety of populations and surgical populations and uh, body weight and uh, lean body weight and the adjusted. So when we are using propofol, we are using a lot of combinations in the neurosurgery, like uh, propofol ketamine combination, propofol dexmed combination, propofol lignocan combination. So it depending upon, I choose based on the patient characteristics and what I want to elicit from the monitoring point of view. And I always use uh, spectral edge frequency in the EEG models, the raw EEG models, because okay. it's rightly available in the models. Yeah. So whenever we are using propofol and dexmed combination, you will definitely get bradycardia and not to worry about it. And you will have hypertension. You won't get hypotension. Pressures yeah. will always be maintained with this combination. And uh, when we are using with the propofol and ketamine also, very good hemodynamics will be maintained. And uh, there's uh, not to worry about uh, hypertension and bradycardia. Uh, that is uh, that is normal. And we usually stop dexmed because it's a long surgery, uh, especially in the brain or uh, spine. Dexmed will stop almost like uh, one and a half hour to two hours. Because oh. the post -operative, post operatively the patients will have a drowsiness and it's a difficult in assessment, post-operative neurological assessment. And the ketamine, yeah. we give around one to one and a half hour time also, because the patient will have a like a delirium kind of features yeah. at the time of extubation with the ketamine and propofol combination. Yeah. So now as of now, we are going with the uh, ketamine and uh, propofol eleven eleven models. They are very good. And if available, use that models. So probably only my mind says there is some uh, reservation to its use in elderly patients, right? Elevated. Yeah, but it is not. Uh, you should not always concentrate on the uh, target site. You should uh, con concentrate on the spectral edge frequency if it is available or base. Yeah. That the whatever the study done on the uh, brain biopsy tissues. It yeah. is a target site concentration and each patient respond to different, if some patient may require less dose for the same kind of uh, BIS response and some may require higher doses. Yeah. So it is always target the BIS or a spectral edge frequency, not the target site. So yeah. that we adjust when we are assessing the burst suppressions and all, we should, a different patient will have a different burst suppression. When you go for the propofol and dexmed, you will have a very good burst suppression at the low doses. Whereas okay. if you are using only propofol, you require a larger doses that causes hypotension. So whenever I require a burst suppression, I will use both dexmed and propofol. So that combination that you have to assess with a raw EEG that will works wonders. So one more probably your suggestion and Dr. Vikas suggestion that is required is for a routine average surgical procedure. 
because you are all dealing with the prolonged neurosurgical procedure, an average procedure like laparoscopies and middle ear surgeries and others, thyroid procedures, youth thyroid patients. Um, would a dose of ketamine um, be beneficial or would be more? No. Uh, when you are uh, using... Boring, oh, boring. Yeah. Yeah. Use only either two drugs. The multiple drugs will cause a post-operative problem in a short surgeries. Yeah. So either propofol fentanyl or propofol ketamine or yeah. propofol dexam. So yeah. don't combine propofol, ketamine, dexamed and like multiple combinations. You don't know what is happening. Yeah. And uh, it is not advisable to do without uh, monitoring the PEEG because you don't know the depth. Sometimes we are maybe overdosing or underdosing. Yeah. And when we are using multiple drugs, the if you use propofol ketamine, the BIS response will be entirely different. Where you are using propofol with the fentanyl, the BIS response will be different. You are maybe overdosing the patients. That's true. Yeah. So that's, a, yeah. so that's, a, that's a very valid point. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Reddy. Uh, because uh, more the drug we use, uh, they have a, a synergistic uh, relation. So, you know, we don't know what uh, is actually happening uh, when it comes to the brain. Uh, let us keep analgesia separate. But when it comes to the hypnosis, uh, every drug will have uh, you know, effect on different parts of the brain and that can, uh, you know, create a level of hypnosis which will delay the emergence from anesthesia. That is one thing. Secondly, as you rightly said, a dexmedinator median needs to be stopped very early, at least uh, uh, 90 minutes before uh, the anticipated uh, surgical closure. Uh, not only because patient remains groggy, but also uh, uh, it, you know, patient's vital strain to be on lower side. So patient may remain little borderline hypertensive or heart rate will also remain lower with you know continuous use of dexmedinone. So that needs to be stopped. Uh, for non neuro uh, for neurosurgery, preferably we need to have uh, depth of anesthesia monitor. Uh, this probably is the most studied uh, uh, monitoring uh, device that we have, and that really works well. Ultimately, that is our target because uh, as he rightly said, and that is what even I was mentioning uh, a while ago that. Studying the brain uh, levels and comparing with the blood levels, plasma levels, will give us some idea. But uh, as we know that every patient has got a different sensitivity to each drug, the requirement of the doses are different. So ultimately, what we need is optimal separation of the cortex, and that needs to be you know assessed using base entropy, whatever is available. Now coming to non-neurosurgical situations uh, where we are using uh, TIVA. So uh, if we have fentanyl, I think that is the best thing that we have because these are the cases where probably a single dose and intermittent boluses of fentanyl will also do. Uh, if we have infusion and if, are, if you don't have the depth of anesthesia monitoring, probably we will be uh, overdosing the patients because we are not uh, balancing the hypnosis and narcosis generated by propofol and fentanyl and that can delay the emergence. So patient may remain uh, groggy, sedated for a long time. So as... Uh, uh, Sumit mentioned a while ago, there will be a deep extubation and we'll be worried. And if it is happening in a small setup for those who are uh, trying to use it in private practice, I think they'll be stuck there. Yeah. So preferably two drugs, uh, one for analgesia and one for hypnosis uh, in straightforward non-neurosurgical cases would be the best thing. Yeah, that, that should be the better approach. And especially as you say, in the absence of depth of anesthesia monitoring, and even in depth of anesthesia monitoring, we, we do have limitations. As you say, they confuse the picture. And even practically speaking, if you are targeting 40 to 60, and there, is, there could be a set of patients with 60 who are very deep. Mm -hmm. Clinically, if you try to assess them, or there could be a set of patients at 40, 40 to 44, who still appear light. Mm -hmm. So that, that much of relative... Uh, no differences would be seen in the population. So that's always there. And uh, of course, a question from uh, Dr. Sir. Yeah, please. Yes. This is Dr. Mangesh. Yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Uh, what I suggest, as Dr. Karne said, that uh, in uh, scoliotic surgery, post-operative pain is a real problem because you have to stop the TY agents. My suggestion is that if we can start buprenorphine transdermal patch 12 hours or 24 hours prior to surgery, buprenorphine patch, so that will take its effect while by the time the surgery is getting over. 
and you can definitely cut off your tuber also so that's a multimodal thing. Definitely, it fits in the definition of uh, like Tiva, very is also with practical benefits. Right, sir? When we have uh, applied a patch 12 hours before, when we have the norphine levels uh, in the plasma, uh, yeah. we probably need to relook at the uh, fentanyl dosing uh, interoperatively because uh, norphine itself it has some it sort of So maybe we need to reduce the fentanyl doses intraoperatively. What yeah. we do in our institute is we use fentanyl and uh, towards extubation, we continue at 0.5 microgram per kg. And yeah. after extubation, we apply a fentanyl patch. And after 24 hours, we remove fentanyl patch and we use buprenorphine patch. This is what we follow. Okay. But of course, monitoring is very important, as you say, yeah. and response to buprenorphine varies quite a lot. That's also important for us to keep in mind in different uh, types of, I mean, not just age groups. In a patient uh, with uh, COPD and other things, you should be very careful. So that always goes with any discussion on opioids. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think one more question. Dr. Swarana has asked, will you not give glycoprolyl routinely whenever ketamine is used as one of the drugs in TIVA to prevent secretions? Unless uh, we are using uh, induction dose of uh, 2 mg per kg, uh, we won't have so much of problem with uh, salivation uh, or secretions. Uh, normally, what we use is a very uh, uh, small dose of ketamine 0.25-2.75 mg per kg and followed by the infusion. So when it is given in a small dose and a uh, small infusion is given as a background infusion, it does not create so much of problem uh, because giving glycoparlate and um, again uh, ketamine uh, in probably induction doses, non-sedative induction dose, will again have problem with the tachycardia and sympathetic stimulation also. But in these cases where we are using just part of the kitty, uh, I don't think we really require glycoparlate. Okay. So in fact, slightly going back to the discussion about a minute ago, uh, what will be the, how do you assess the clinical uh, parameters vis-a-vis -vis the BISSAR entropy before you decide that, yes, the depth of anesthesia has been reached? Whenever we have BIS, we go by BIS. But uh, when we are looking at the hemodynamic parameters, uh, we also consider two other things. One is whether we have provided adequate analgesia because that is one important aspect. So patient may be adequately uh, sedated, uh, maybe under anesthesia, but uh, analgesia is not adequate and that will cause tachycardia that may cause hypertension. So before I judge uh, anything about the base, if my patient is having uh, tachycardia or hypertension, probably I will uh, ensure that adequate analgesia is given. So maybe I'll use another dose of fentanyl or increase the infusion of fentanyl or maybe give a small bolus of ketamine uh, in analgesic doses and see the response. If it is settling down, then probably I will not uh, you know, uh, judge the base response. Okay. So it's again, uh, I think initial induction part is the one which we should be very you know, um, in monitoring and adjusting the dosage or add drugs like ketamine. Yes. Those are things which are very important. And once the, it's it's in the maintenance phase, it's like in auto mode. So basically the infusion will be going to the patient and think of the alternative analgesic options. Also for the patient. Yeah. When we're using purely TIVA, uh, what I would say is our infusion need to start along with the induction. So yes. there shouldn't be a gap between you know, induction because we achieve a plasma level of propofol with whatever background analysis that we're using. And if there is delay in starting the infusion, that is why the TCI or TIVA, at least TIVA, should be used where we use syringe pump itself for the induction of anesthesia and then continue the same infusion for the maintenance so that the plasma level remains at expected level and these uh, you know variations in the depth will not happen. So the technical things in terms of uh, the, the, the TCA pump and uh, the tubing and everything is uh, like primed and it is already on. Clearly on. So good, good discussion. But when you talk spoke about the demerits, one of the, the commonly asked questions is you are using um, 
is there anything related to the environmental hazards related to propofol disposal and the plastic that is used is there something about it you can comment on uh see it is it is both ways yeah so today uh, if inhalation is being used more we will probably talk about ozone depletion tomorrow yeah. if we switch over to tvc it's all industry also has a role to play so <laughs> <laughs> so that will be question that we are polluting uh, uh, the river the we are polluting the water and uh, uh, we are also creating a lot of plastic so that is going to be there but with uh, modernization i think whatever we do we are harming the environment no doubt whether we use uh, inhalational or we use uh, totally intravenous we are harming it it could still be balanced and yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yes, have sir. one question. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, is there any cost analysis is done on the TIVA and on uh, inhalation analysis here? There are uh, many uh, uh, such uh, articles which are available. One of the famous article which was published in Anesthesiology Journal in nineteen ninety five, I guess the title was uh, uh, Pennywise. Uh, on Polish. Ah, uh -huh. so. That was the first article which talked about the cost analysis of uh, totally intravenous anesthesia when it was just gearing up, and there are many articles there. See, it cost-wise definitely uh, it will have a um, little more uh, expensive, little more I'll say. But if you look at the total cost of the surgery, the cost of anesthesia remains a very small, and out of that, these drugs that we are using technically are negligible. So if if we compare it in terms of percentage. uh between inhalational and intravenous probably it might appear to be big difference uh however the cost of uh, propofol which is to be a problem has definitely come down remifentanil will again reverse the equations but when we compare the cost effectiveness uh, of inhalational versus volatile in the total surgical bill sir it is absolutely negligible okay but still for the patient it matters <laughs> yes yeah but uh, if see how how they um, analyze that if the recovery is in better so if my patient is not having significant post operative nausea vomiting if my patient is yes. having uh, clear headed recovery he go goes back to normal starts accepting orally early yeah. gets mobilized early probably the stay goes down that is one of the advantages yeah. so once the hospital stay goes down the allos goes down the yeah. the cost that we are paying more for probably uh, these things will compensate yeah because uh, they say that old habits die hard now for example we are using reversal agents when we give vacuronium or rocuronium and they are companies are promoting atracidem saying that you don't need reversal but how many of anesthetists don't give reversal after atracidem <laughs> no that's that's a valid question because uh, for uh, even atracidem uh, you know the neuromuscular the uh, baseline neuromuscular block blockade uh, you know to uh, recover completely we need to give that much time and yeah. probably we don't have that much time to wait and that's the reason we give reversal yeah, yeah. agree sir so concepts keep changing in the sense of for example even 0.9 qf is not adequate nowadays <laughs> so we are <laughs> to wait for total recovery then try to follow up on the patient and yeah. it's era of regional anesthesia analgesia with the advent of ultrasound yeah so definitely there is going to be some value addition to nilestal or balanced anesthesia which we are doing yeah. but at the same time the advantages of uh, total intravenous anesthesia are continue to stay yeah. in terms of early recovery in terms of reduced qo in week emergence spot especially it is more smoother i think these are as you say currently they are the advantages so mm -hmm. we'll wait for the future uh, for any real um, uh, evidences or uh, pharmacy driven evidences <laughs> for the field <laughs> okay thank you thank you so i think any more questions from the participants here um, youngsters and our senior colleagues there are rent any <laughs> so uh, we will have uh, the presentation uploaded in the youtube also after some editing uh, by tomorrow 
and i think uh, thank you very much dr vikas for having participated in today's program and uh, we had nice interactions from uh, both uh, our seniors uh, dr giri and uh, dr lakshman dr mangesh dr bonde and uh, youngsters also uh, so did, thank you very much and good night everybody thank you sir thank you dr vikas thank you thank you sir good night everybody thank you good night